In two days in August 1945, the United States emerged as the world's leading power. It is a fact of life that following World War II was a new beginning, a new beginning for the United States in world affairs, in foreign policy, in foreign affairs. How would that power be used? Fifty-six years later, as all of us were searching in some way after September 11, 2001, my own search began with a simple question. Why would it happen? In the wake of the attacks, the question was obscured by a sea of red, white, and blue. After September 11th, I wondered if our national interest conflicts with the interests of others. Self-interest. Vital interest. National interest. Vital American interest. What's driven our national interest? In a globalized world, is putting national interest over a broader human interest actually in our interest? And do the government and media tell us the realities of U.S. foreign policy? Throughout the world, our name stands for international justice. We must complete a structure of peace. I pledge an uninterrupted and sincere search for peace. For the sake of peace and justice, let us move toward a world in which all people are at last free to determine their own destiny. I've heard that speech a thousand times to this very day, but when we look at U.S. actions, does it really ring true? In fact, planning documents just after World War II show that, above all, U.S. actions aim to maintain a huge economic advantage. George Kennan, head of the State Department policy planning staff in 1948, is considered by many to be the architect of post-World War II U.S. foreign policy. His words were clear. The United States has had its hand in a lot of places since World War II. Guatemala, Vietnam, East Timor, El Salvador, Palestine and Israel. In whose interest were these interventions? Our trip began in Guatemala. The story of Guatemala is a really sad, awful story. And in large part, it's a story that was financed by the U.S. We have major responsibility for what happened in Guatemala. And I don't know that most people even know about it. So in 1951, Jacobo Arbenz was democratically elected president by a wide margin. He started a program of social reforms, distributing land to half a million peasants. Now one major U.S. corporation, United Fruit, had owned a lot of that land. United Fruit wielded a lot of power in Guatemala, owning or controlling its telephone system, its major Atlantic harbor, its banana exports, and its railway system. Vehemently against Arbenz's government, United Fruit used its influence within the United States to push for a coup, which took place in 1954. Arbenz's programs had benefited the people of Guatemala and had had their overwhelming support. And although the speeches say the United States stands for democracy, maybe not when democracy threatens U.S. economic interests. The United States intervened in Guatemala precisely because it was democratic. They wanted to pre prevent the democratic revolution. Uh, we have rich internal records on this. The concern was that the social reforms undertaken by the first democratically elected government in Guatemala ever had the overwhelming support of the population, uh, represented the interests and concerns of most of the people of Guatemala, and worst of all, were being looked at by others in the region as a kind of a model that they might want to follow themselves, and therefore it had to be aborted.
Guatemala. Decíamos, o sea, nos decían que nosotros éramos mayas y estudiantes. Era un delito para ellos. Nos comenzaron a perseguir, eh, mataron a muchos de nosotros. En los pueblos exterminaban a familias completas. Amit Koch, an artist and a student in the 80s, was targeted by the military. Not a hardcore activist, he described himself as simply not liking what was going on. But any dissent was dangerous in those years, and Amit was followed, captured, and brought to prison. Que, que me castigan. Ahí entra alguien que me quita la ropa y me amarran el miembro con una, con una eh, nosotros decimos allá en Guatemala con una pita, que me amarran el miembro y cada, cada rato me jalaban. Y me, me, amarraron, eh, eh, me amarraron las manos y yo sentía, yo, incluso yo les dije, mejor mátenme. Yo les pedía, por favor, mátenme, porque era cruel lo que me estaban haciendo. Why is it that massacres and torture were being carried out by a military backed by my government and with the support of our tax dollars? And why is it that a lot of the time, we don't know about it? The goddess of peace turned her face towards Southeast Asia and wept. For man was at war again. Why do we keep coming back to Vietnam? It seems to be one of those places that we talk about again and again. But this was a long war, and those that made it back are still telling their stories. We fired some, uh, some barrages into this village, and the guy told me, uh, good shot, you got, the, you got the chicken coop, the clothesline, and you should see Granny and the kids run. And I still dream about that, because that was the first time I realized that we weren't just shooting soldiers, we weren't bombarding military targets, we were actually bombing villages where ordinary people lived and worked. Those who, who fought the air war or there were at sh ships at sea, they never heard the screams, saw the blood, saw the body parts. I saw the blood. I had clothing that I had to li literally peel off my body. It was so c encrusted and covered with blood after battles that I, I saw the body parts of my fellow Marines, and I certainly saw the enemy's body parts. But what happened to me was I had a job to do, and if I survived and if I was doing my job well, that's all that really would count. It was always the enemy that we were fighting. And that's a very important psychological realization to have because if you really feel you're killing fellow human beings who are living, breathing parents or children of other living human beings, it's a very different thing than if you feel there's an enemy to kill. So I went over and I killed an enemy. What would the world look like if we hadn't fought against communism at the time of Vietnam? I, I think I may have been sold a bill of goods, and I think maybe this culture was sold a bill of goods, posing the communists as a great enemy. It was the same concern as Guatemala, namely successful independent development in some area might stimulate others to try to do the same. And then the dominoes start to fall and maybe it reaches as far as Indonesia or Japan and the U.S. would lose its dominant role in the region. World War II vets could always talk about how they liberated Europe and stopped the Nazi slaughter of innocents in the death camps and stuff like that. We don't have those stories. We have stories of burning down people's villages, of, of shore bombarding uh, fishing villages, of laying people in the, in the ditch at, at My Lai and killing over 400 old men, women, and children. That's our stories, and that's what we have to live with. East Timor, in and of itself, never mattered to the United States. The U.S. could have cared less if East Timor became independent or not. 
what mattered and what had long mattered was Indonesia. Indonesia was the fifth most populous country in the world. It was a leading member and a moderate one at that of OPEC, the oil cartel. It was also a very lucrative center for multinational corporate activity and at the same time geopolitically Indonesia sits astride very key sea lanes. Remember this is Southeast Asia in 1975. The United States had just quote unquote lost Vietnam, lost Cambodia. And what the primary U.S. objective in the region at that time was the maintenance of pro-American regimes. And Indonesia was probably the most important country. So when Indonesia wanted to annex East Timor, the United States was more than willing to go along. On December 7, 1975, the Indonesian military invaded the nearby island of East Timor. The left-wing friendly movement said in his first message, we need help, paratroopers are dropping everywhere. At times, nearly hysterical, he said that women and children were being fired on and the Indonesians were killing indiscriminately. Just two days before the invasion, President Gerald Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had visited Indonesia. Ford and Kissinger were concerned that the use of U.S. arms in the invasion could create problems at home, but concluded that they could construe the action as defensive. The power the U.S. held in the situation is apparent. Kissinger said it would be better if the invasion started after he and Ford returned to the United States. Fourteen hours after the U.S. left, the Indonesian military invaded. This was the beginning of a 24-year struggle for independence in East Timor. Technically, they did get independence finally, but that's after near genocide, uh, which was backed by the United States overwhelmingly. It's one of the worst crimes of the late 20th century. We have a lot of painful story. 200,000 people is killed, and more than them disappear. The bad never come back. Both the U.S. and Britain continued to support it right to the end. Right through 1999, Britain and the United States knew perfectly well that the Indonesian forces they had armed and trained were carrying out major atrocities. In 1999, 78% of the East Timorese population voted for independence. Just after the vote, the Indonesian military and its militia groups went on a rampage, driving 75 to 80 percent of the people from their homes and destroying much of the country. U.S. support continued even then, until public pressure in Australia and the U.S. became too strong. Clinton finally told the Indonesian army, it's over, call it off. And the relations of power are so overwhelming that within 48 hours, the Indonesian army began to leave which tells you just what could have been done uh, 25 years earlier, in fact, all the time through. They are very cruel. They, uh, they didn't consider the people as uh, human beings, but they considered the stimulus people as uh, mosquitoes. Even the animal. What happened in East Timor has entered into what we might call the national forgettery. Most people are well aware that something terrible happened in East Timor. What we don't know on a collective level is what the U.S. role was. Peace. Democracy. Peace. 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 Democracy. Freedom. Peace. Democracy. Human rights. Peace, democracy, democracy, freedom, peace, human rights, democracy. People in the U.S. in the bottom of themselves understand that in order to have this comfort that we have here in the U.S., there must be poverty somewhere else.
For the United States, the biggest role to be played in El Salvador is that of a friend. A friend helping the El Salvadoran people create an atmosphere of peace, an atmosphere in which the democratic system that already exists can grow and flourish. El Salvador. A determined propaganda campaign has sought to mislead many in Europe and certainly many in the United States as to the true nature of the conflict in El Salvador. How do you define the price? I mean, if you want to talk about 75,000 innocent people killed and paid for by our tax dollars, no, I don't think intervention was worth it. I think it was a horrible mistake. So by now it seems to be a familiar story. The population of El Salvador wanted to pursue a path that deviated from the U.S. model. So the U.S. pumped a million dollars a day into the war to prevent that path, while telling us otherwise. Our principles are rooted in self-government and non-intervention. They wanted to impose a model, you know, and we Salvadorians were rejecting that model, and we were very loud. So it was the tiny little country going against the will of the giant. So what was that will? It's clear that the United States called the tune in El Salvador, but to what end? The major concern was that social change could become contagious and impact neighboring countries. The U.S. instituted a military coup, the usual reaction, called it a democracy. It was, in fact, a military regime. That military regime was fighting a group of guerrillas that is generally thought to have represented most of El Salvador's people. The tactics used to fight the guerrillas had a direct impact on those people. The people were the water and the guerrillas were the fish. So the government said, in order to kill the fish, we need to take all the water away so the fish will die. There were no holds barred. I remember talking to a lieutenant at a roadblock and a person from one of the villages where I was working had been tortured by the army, had been filled up with water, forced water, and then jammed out of his stomach. Uh, and I said to the guy, well, how, what is this? How do you do this to people? And he said, well, he's a communist. As I will be waiting for the bus in the porch of the mayor's office, you know, there will be one, two, three bodies, uh, this member every day. And, you know, that was sort of normal uh, during those years. You know, the 80s was the year where the most people were killed in the period of the war. They simply defined an area as the enemy and obliterated it, slaughtered livestock, poisoned water. I mean, it was this incredibly brutal and non-strategic approach to, to war. The one survivor of the massacre of El Mozote, this woman, her name is Rufina, she said it's good that the U.S. government and the Salvadoran government have come to help rebuild the town that they destroyed. She said, I'm still waiting for one of them to come and apologize for what they did. The fundamental flaw of foreign policy at that time was not telling people the truth. And I have no doubts that if people knew the truth, it would have stopped. But we were really fed a steady diet of untruths about what was going on, what we were doing, and what was being done in our name. The state of Israel had been proclaimed, and the people rejoiced in their new nation, a haven of refuge for the displaced and persecuted members of the Jewish faith from all over the world. There is, first of all, what one dissident Israeli has called Israel's original sin. This is the realization that Zionism could not establish a Zionist state in a Palestine already inhabited by a majority of Arabs without seriously impairing the rights of the Palestinians. The reluctance, if not the refusal, of the Israelis and their sponsors among the great powers to make this confession is one obstruction in the way of a just peace.
While the U.S. has presented itself as an honest mediator in the dispute between Israel and Palestine, in fact, the U.S. has overwhelmingly supported one side. Why is this? Because uh, I'm not out of any particular hatred for the Palestinians. It's just uh, they have essentially nothing to offer to the United States. They have no wealth. They have no power. Uh, in contrast, uh, Israel is a rich, advanced industrial society, a military-based economy, tightly linked to the U.S., base for a projection of U.S. power in the region, has a lot to offer. So therefore, they ought to control uh, the region. Therefore, no, uh, no rights for the Palestinians. We must make certain that Israel does get all the planes and other sophisticated equipment that she must have. We're sending all these ammunitions and weapons yearly, over $3 billion of weapons, the latest sophisticated weapons that America can produce, is, is what's killing the Palestinian children. How would that make people feel? What kind of message are we as Americans sending the Palestinian people? High-level Israeli planning documents from 1948 indicate that Palestinian refugees would either assimilate elsewhere or would be crushed. The documents continue, stating that some of them would die and most of them would turn into human dust and the waste of society and join the most impoverished classes in the Arab countries. In the early 70s, Israeli leader Moshe Dayan advised his Labor Party to tell the Palestinians that you shall continue to live like dogs and whoever wishes may leave. In such an atmosphere, and with Israel's backing by the world's leading power, the situation for Palestinians seems desperate. They see no hope and they see no future. And that's where all the violence, I believe, is coming to. People think, you see, that the Arabs or the Palestinians are some peculiarly fanatical and militant people. As though the American people, or the British people, undergoing the same experience as the Palestinians, wouldn't react in exactly the same manner or more militant still. A movement that is so national and political like Zionism couldn't foresee that its own action is going to produce a movement that is equally forceful in assertion of its right over the land. I mean, and in a way, just as Zionism was born, so to speak, in the wombs of anti-Semitism, the more the anti-Semites in Europe wanted to crush Jewish identities, the more forceful Jewish identity became. That's what happened to the Palestinian. Suppose we, like the Palestinians, who after all were 93% of the population of Palestine in 1917, suppose we'd had to accept immigration on a Palestinian scale. 30 million, say, or 40 million. And suppose these immigrants had come not to share our society with us, but avowedly to build their own state in Britain, to raise their own flag over London. How would the British react? Are you telling me that there wouldn't even be a, a small minority of our more unstable young men who would not react just as brutally as the PFLP have reacted? The British would react in such a way as to make the Palestinians look like flower children. It is just possible that if the United States exerted its power and influence in ways which are consistent with our own law and values, we might break out of the vicious circle. Yes, there is hate. Yes, there is mistrust. But I think when people start building it, all these boundaries will be removed. Uh, occupation will end. The rights of the Palestinians are met. I think with time, things will heal. People forget. People forget. I don't know if they can forgive, but people want to move on. They are so sick and tired of seeing blood on both sides. In each one of the countries you mentioned, five countries, there were independent forces that were seeking a way out of this system of domination, and they therefore had to be crushed. And they were crushed in different ways. Americans have every reason to take pride in what their country has achieved in foreign policy. With the guiding factor in U.S. foreign policy being the maintenance of the U.S.'s dominant role, in whose interest is our involvement around the globe? It's in the interest of those who dominate uh, decisions internal to the United States. Economic power is very narrowly concentrated in a small corporate sector, tightly linked to the state, controls both political parties, owns the media, yeah, they naturally make uh, decisions in their own interest. 
I think the hope lies in the people, not in a political theory, not in a smart U.S. foreign policy, but in these people who are becoming more and more aware of their inherent human dignity and an increasing determination to live in a way and to create a system and, and a place that will respect that and honor that and allow that to unfold. The Quran says that if you take one life, it's as if you kill the whole world. If you save one life, it's as if you save the whole world. Then the Bible says they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So it seems to me both those ideas are pretty good ideas. And if we could, uh, Muslim, Christian, and other folks could come together around those kind of ideas, we'd be a lot better off than around the ideas of trying to kill each other. Operation Double Life Cool, move past the setbacks. It'll take a better trap. I see past the mass delusion. The media's collusion with political abusing. The empire's crumbling. Now wars are fought in ruins. My point of view is screwed a bit. My skin invites unruliness with hooligans in three piece suits to ruin movements. The wind of discontent is bent on ending this existence. The echoes of the past exact the grim shit we live with. It's parasitic, breaking down barricades without limits. Some pawns are timid, falling prey to everyday living and dying slow. The tide ain't